Now, please join me in welcoming Lieutenant General Bob Wood, Executive Vice President, FC International, to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you being here with us this morning. Uh, we have a, uh, a, a sighting of our last panelist. She's be with us in about two minutes, so I think we're, <laughs> our timing was just about right. Uh, we appreciate you making it uh, here this morning, day two. Uh, a wonderful event, I think, un underway. Great content. Uh, we started yesterday morning with General Crawl uh, at uh, the luncheon speaker. He set a remarkable uh, high bar for the level of content, and we've continued on from that point discussing a variety of things yesterday that uh, really uh, show the kind of challenges facing, uh, in this case, a service CIO, uh, looking at the variety of challenges uh, as we move into the 21st century. Uh, learned a couple new terms, uh, his uh, mission, uh, marine information groups, uh, three priority areas, uh, progress, consistency, and persistence seem to be uh, solidly behind what the Marine Corps is doing. He mentioned that six months ago, uh, he would not have been able to give, give the same brief, but uh, with progress and determination and, uh, frankly, the reality of the world, uh, they're moving uh, in the information domain in a remarkable direction, constituting a variety of new capabilities inherent to the Marine Corps, not necessarily borrowed from other services. But uh, what you saw was a, a leader uh, seized by the realities of uh, the information domain and, and uh, really putting uh, uh, put form and structure around what they're about. A panel then, we had a panel that uh, looked at moving from cyber as it used to be uh, to cyber as it is now, an operating domain as opposed to an administrative space. Uh, that panel, I think, uh, I know Mr. Donahue was, General Donahue was very articulate about that, General Baslett describing uh, the mission assurance side of the Air Force mission as it looked at the information domain. We're doing exactly what we intended to do with military communications and this conference in general, talking about the front edge of our demands as it relates to all services, agencies, and activities that we look at in the information domain for security purposes. So today we're really blessed to have uh, two panels and one speaker, General Crawford, at lunch, our panel with us this morning and a panel this afternoon, talking about a variety of activities, in this case data and acquisition. Uh, and mission, mission for the Army. So once again, reinforcing that front edge of what our information and our communication challenges are and where we are with the variety of leaders who are leading the way as we determine and define what it is we have to do in the defense and security space. Behind you, opening up at 1030, is uh, all of our exhibitors with an array of solutions. Uh, and after our panel, we have uh, that will be open to you. And uh, I think we're, uh, we're on the way to not only have uh, the missions and challenges described to us, but also the technology solutions that are available. Uh, we are uh, in this in similar format. Uh, we will, as you heard, the questions be uh, just text and email your questions for this uh, this panel, and we will be more than ready to have them posed from the back. They'll post the questions to our speakers, and we'll be able to get the answers you're looking for, and a little time, I think, to spend with them after the event is over. Now, we are uh, very, very happy to have as our moderator today someone known to most of you uh, in the defense space without question, uh, Mr. Terry Halverson, who is, uh, as we knew him in last life, the uh, CIO of the Department of Defense now, working as uh, uh, a CIO, the uh, global CIO. Uh, really, uh, information, uh, once again, is central to his mission and task with Samsung. Uh, so I think he's had uh, a little bit of uh, experience now on, on the other side of uh, this demand and uh, other side of this supply, and he'll be a great, I think, moderator for the panel. Always willing to speak his mind, always provocative. We've trapped him here at the desk. He doesn't have a lavalier mic, can't walk through the audience. It's going to be hard, hard, hard on him. Uh, but I guarantee uh, he'll, he'll drive the discussion in a way uh, that we're choosing this audience to hear. When I ask uh, Mr. Halverson about what it is he was particularly interested in focusing on, uh, data was immediately uh, mentioned. Data and its uh, use, it's uh, the reality of data storage, data acquisition, and uh, the utility of data and the variety of solutions we're after. So I think he's helped with the panel he's put together to take a good sharp look at that and certainly with his experience now in Samsung, an ability to put that in, in a corporate context. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, without any further ado, I'd like to let our panel get underway and uh, introduce to you Mr. Terry Halverson and he'll make introductions on his panel. Thank you. 
Bob, thank you, and thank you all for being here. So just so we can start with some controversy right off the bat, um, this panel, and we're very privileged to have them, and Essie will be here in a minute, but we've got Barb and we've got Kristen, all-female panel. I think that's important, and it is by design. Um, a lot of news about what's going on in the country, the way we've some people have been treating women, stuff like that. I do think in the IT industry, we need to step that up a little bit too. Uh, and recognize that we do have some fantastic female leaders in this business, uh, and we've got three of them that are the top today. So I'm not going to talk much today. That's rare. Uh, and, and turn it over to the panel to talk. But what I do want to do is set the tone. It is about data, and more specifically, it is about mobile data. Data at rest, data, and when I say data at rest, I'm not talking about uh, normal data at rest. I'm talking really about data at rest. It's not moving, it's, it's not where it needs to be for people to use it. Today, you look at your lifestyles, look at your own lifestyles. We're all moving around a lot. I mean, yesterday I was in Canada, Saturday I was in Australia, and Monday of the week before I was in Australia, I was in Germany. My data needs to travel with me, and it needs to travel with me in a secure way, accessible way, and I need to be able to pull the bits of data that I need when I need them. That's the way the world's operating today. That's only going to get faster. You're going to see more change in that. It is going to be about mobile data. It's not about the devices. It's not about uh, the systems. It's about the data itself. How do I get it there? How do I move it around in ways that people can use it, access it at the times they need to, to make informed, intelligent decisions. So the panel we've got today, we have Barb Hoffman. Barb is uh, the Deputy for Enterprise Services at the DOD CIO. She will be talking about data from that perspective. We have Kirsten Sheep, President Obama advisor, uh, very prominent in cybersecurity, cyber data. She'll be talking about all of those aspects from a uh, policy today and anything else. And then Essie, who is currently, to Essie Miller, is the current director of security at the DOD CIO. She came from the Army, so she'll give a more service perspective of what we need to do with security, because all of those things have to change. The way we look at that whole business, uh, we were talking about policy a little bit this morning, or, or maybe the lack of some policy that needs to be, have some discussions. So what I will tell you is there are no set questions today. Uh, I'm going to have Barb uh, open this up. She'll talk about five, ten minutes on what she does, and then we'll go right down with the panel. And then we will take questions from, and there's Essie. Essie, thank you. And so you don't feel bad. I, we, we all just kind of walked in. Everybody was playing the Baltimore traffic game this morning. But we're going to have everybody talk about five, ten minutes, give you their perspective on some things. We'll sum that up and then we're going to go right into questions from the audience. You all paid your money and I think it's important that you get to put your voices into the panel as much as you hear from the panelists. So with that, Barb, over to you. All right. I am going to try and weave in the data, the women in uh, federal government, as well as some of the IT uh, experiences I have had in the DOD. Um, I think it starts with leadership in DOD to ensure that we have diversity among females, minorities, every uh, uh, type of person we need to have in our workforce. From that, you get a wide range of skills, ideas, uh, very balanced, and that could be anywhere from uh, age of people, a lot of the younger generation. A lot of the younger generation come to us from a very, very different perspective. They grew up with mobile devices. Everything they do, they want to do it from their mobile phone. In the Department of Defense, we don't have, uh, I'll say, a wide diversity of that experience for them. A lot of our data that we have is in silos. Uh, we have a lot of legacy infrastructure. We're trying to figure out what do we do with it? How do we get that data? How do we move it forward? Uh, Secretary, uh, this Deputy Secretary of Defense we have today for this administration, he has uh, issued a memorandum that says he wants to accelerate migrating to the cloud. And what do we do? How do we get that data that we have in our legacy systems to the cloud? We can't afford to modernize it. It's too expensive. Uh, so we have all these wonderful silos. Um, in my career, the last, I'll say, five, 
10 years or so. I've been very fortunate to have some fabulous leaders that have uh, promoted women. Uh, and I'm not saying promote women just because they're women, but to make sure they had the right skill sets, that they had the right personalities, and that they were able and equipped to do the job. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I had the pleasure of standing up the joint service provider in the Pentagon. Uh, the leadership I had at the time came to me and said, we have an idea we want to have a single service provider in the Pentagon. We don't know how, how you're going to do it, you go figure it out. So I got with the various leaders that were in the Army and in the OSD, and we sat around and we talked for a few days, and we came up with quite a few ideas uh, as to how to do this. We put together a concept, we put together a, uh, a document to walk the Secretary of Defense through how we could do this. We had uh, some rough order of estimates on how it could save money, how it could benefit, how we could uh, improve the workforce, have a more diverse workforce. And uh, in March, or it was May, May of 2015, Secretary of Defense at the time agreed. It made sense. It would save money. It was going to uh, improve our security because we didn't have multiple organizations doing uh, service provider type uh, efforts. It was going to streamline contracts. It was going to streamline people and resources and patching of our infrastructure and our networks. So that is one example. Uh, in the last year or so, we have established a, uh, an, an effort called Enterprise Collaboration and Productivity Solution. And it is trying to streamline all of the office productivity solutions in the Department of Defense. And that's all of Department of Defense. Uh, we've been working for a year gathering requirements, uh, coming up with our business case, uh, working with SE. SE and I share a office suite in the Pentagon together. And so how are we going to secure this information? Because we are trying to go horizontally across DOD. And so identity management and all those things are a really big uh, issue and risk that we have to deal with in DOD. How are we going to secure that data? And then uh, probably lastly, uh, the last initiative that uh, DOD is working with is uh, the Windows 10 initiative. How do we standardize on a standard operating platform? Back in 2016, the Secretary of Defense at the time said that uh, we had too many multiple uh, security platforms that we needed to migrate to one, and that platform was Windows 10. And so we had a very strong campaign and mandate to migrate, and we're well on our way to Windows 10. Not quite there yet, but we will get there. But again, that helps you to standardize so that you can have applications and security and data that can all start to be standardized in DOD. And once you get to that level, you can learn how to do uh, applications to use your mobile devices and things like that so that as you do travel around the world, you can access your data. <laughs> That's it. Good. So I'll, I'll take a minute to sum up. A little bit what Barb was doing. So as she was putting those things together, good probably progress, but what it did expose is the problems with data. You heard Barb talk about legacy. We've got data in DOD, and, and most places have this problem, anything that's of size. You've got data that's structured in a legacy way that is really hard to extract the way you need it. It's hard to be able to see things in a way that you, you, you can get you value. The other thing that I would say, data today is, is, is the world's platinum. I mean, it is the most valuable thing that you have, and it is driving the economy if you can pull the value out of it. Um, but it is hard to pull that value, and it's hard to pull it out in a, in a timely way. And the other problem we have is today, the policies that we have really don't support that as well as they need to, which now gives me an expert on that. Kirsten, if you jump in, thank you. Thanks very much. And Thank you for the opportunity to be here and uh, to talk. And as always, uh, Terry is looking at these issues in the right, the right and the provocative way, um, because these are the issues right now that are so critical. I'll start off just by talking about mobile security in general, <laughs> and just looking at where we are with mobile security. 
So the very things that make mobile devices such a productivity, productivity tool are the exact same things that make them a big target for espionage and for malicious activity. We saw most recently Chief of Staff John Kelly's phone getting compromised, and by all accounts that was likely by a nation state actor, given what he wasn't able to do. And when we talk about compromise, we're looking at being able to enable the microphone, being able to access data that's going through the, the smartphones, the devices, being able to take pictures of a surrounding area, and understanding what that means. And so we typically have looked at smartphones as a peripheral device, but I think we all appreciate right now that the smartphones that we each hold are really the access points into both our personal and our professional lives. And the data that travels through those devices is critical. And we'll talk a little bit, I'll mention a little bit about the difference between, I think, what's happening with critical information and critical infrastructure. But I wanted just to then step back and look at three key issues when we're looking at data protection. As uh, Terry mentioned, last year I served as the executive director of uh, the Commission on Enhancing National Cybersecurity. This was a bipartisan independent commission looked at securing, looking at securing the digital economy today and into the future. And one of the key issues that came up was the issue of interdependencies. So the commission was asked to look at critical infrastructure and it identified early on that critical infrastructure doesn't have the boundaries that we once thought it did. We no longer can really put a box around what is critical infrastructure and what is not. Because in the era of the Internet of Things, in an era of interdependencies, those lines get much more blurry. One of our commissioners was the CISO of Uber. And if you asked him what his business model goal was for Uber 12 months down the road, he said, I have enough cars saturating the streets of San Francisco that I believe I can time traffic lights so that I can control the traffic patterns in San Francisco to be more effective. Essie's wishing he had done that for Baltimore and Washington, D.C. about two hours ago. But he said, I can do this, and I can do this across the nation. But if you ask Joe Sullivan if he wants Uber to be critical infrastructure, he will tell you absolutely not. We also heard from some of the social media companies, and this was a year ago, and, and there's more I'll comment on this, but if you ask social media companies what their business model intention is, they'll tell you we have a cool technology to bring people together around the world through pictures, through communications. If you ask a t social media company if they want to be critical infrastructure, they will tell you absolutely not. But look at the data that they're aggregating and look at where that data is being stored. How are we defining the difference between critical infrastructure and critical information when all of that data on, and that information is mobile? And so looking at what we need to do from a policy perspective to evolve our thinking around the protection of data, data that is mobile, data that is coming with you all the time, has to be the next step. And finally, in sort of the, the latest and greatest when we look at Equifax, it's understanding that this truly is an issue of critical information. How are we now challenging the security of our economic security, our national security, when the means by which we are determining credit and the different parts of the infrastructure of our country are being compromised by what that credit looks like? The second key piece I'll talk just briefly about uh, is the government organization, and, and the way that I'll address this is we talk a lot about public-private pl collaboration when it comes to protection. So when we look at data protection, when we look at critical infrastructure protection, government does a great job with incident response. We do really well when something happens and then we can mobilize troops, we can mobilize forces, we can mobilize efforts. But what we're not doing great at with industry and government is pre-event collaboration. Taking a page out of the DOD playbook, we need to be working more effectively together before something happens when we're looking at protecting our infrastructure and protecting our information. It's about bringing senior leaders of industry and government together to train, to exercise, to engage with each other. Because information sharing is a byproduct of trust, and trust happens through relationships. We can't just identify information sharing as a destination. We have to put the work in to get there. And the third piece of, of data security and what data is doing is how it's affecting our workforce. 
It is changing our pattern of behavior and how we engage the workforce. One of the issues that we talked a lot about on the commission was do we invest in automation and big data and machine learning or do we invest in training and educating the workforce? Well, I think everyone agrees that those two are not uh, mutually exclusive, that you have to invest in both. But in doing so, we have to appreciate that the way in which we do that happens through mobile data, happens through the security of that data, and being able to secure the devices that people use in order to work more effectively. Right now, we have to appreciate that mobile devices are an endpoint priority equal to, or I would argue even more so, important than the laptops and the desktops that we each use. And being able to develop the policies around protecting the information on our mobile devices and importantly, protecting the data is what has to happen. Critical information has to be the priority for looking at how we secure devices, data, and how we're securing our workforce. Thank you. Thank you, and I think there's some really key there and probably the biggest takeaway as I have listened to this discussion, we're not going to be able to define critical infrastructure in the way we used to. It, in fact, it is going to get defined for us by our critical information. And that is going to take cooperation between all sectors, the government, private sector, academia, in ways we have not been very successful at in the past. It really is going to take a combined effort to get this Right. It is a dynamic, ever-changing environment that's just not going to stand still. And of course, in the security aspect of this, we are in, and, and call it an arms race if you want, call it a competitive environment, call it Mad Magazine on steroids. It is changing every day in the security area. So with that small problem, let's hear from Essie. Maybe not. So I think the, the key to start here with everything that's been said, the bottom line for me is dependable mission assurance. You know, we talk a great deal about technology, we talk a great deal about use of commercial best practices and quick adoption of technology. But when we look across the Department of Defense, the mission comes back to the warfighter. And absent of everything, the question becomes how do we ensure credible, dependable mission assurance in face of a credible cyber threat? So that drives us, I think, to shift the conversation from the age-old discussion on compliance to more risk assessment. You know, how do we identify where our credible, true risks are? And that goes, I think, back to what Barb and Kirsten both talked about, understanding the data, the value of the data, where that data is and how we protect it. And that spans everything from identity management to encryption of the data, data in transit, data at rest, and data analytics. You know, how do we maximize the use of that data? But one of the areas that we're beginning to delve more into, although we speak a lot about supply chain management, what about risk in that supply chain? And how are we holding our industry partners accountable for introducing risk into the process for us? So the cybersecurity uh, defense, in defense infrastructure board, cybersecurity forum, gives us an opportunity to work with some of our commercial partners to identify the things that they have to do as we push data their way to fulfill their contractual agreements with us. The struggle that we have there is most of the small businesses that we deal with find that to be an expensive proposition. So then the challenge becomes for us, how do we make sure they understand, again, the value of the data that we're pushing to them? Is back to what I originally said, everything that we talk about from identity management to encryption to disposition of the data flows from us to our industry partners. So I think we need to look at this or begin to look at it a little bit holistically, especially with regard to policy so that we, we move away from, and I don't know if there are any NIST folks in the room, the risk management framework as it is today, where we're talking about hundreds of security controls to really, no kidding, what's the value of the data? Where do we need to store it? How do we need to protect it? And what's the true risk associated with it as we aggregate it, to Kristen's earlier point? Uh, 
as we do that, I think we enable the professionals to move away from that checklist kind of mentality to really looking at what's the operational mission and what they need to protect and how best to protect that. That will be, I think, a true shift for us, not only from a professional aspect and how we recruit and retain our folks and train them in the midst of that, but how we take the workforce that we have today and shift their mentality and change the conversation. Otherwise, I think we'll find ourselves a bit irrelevant as we do things like cloud adoption, where the conversation really should be around, if I move into an environment that I assume is protected, I still have responsibility to protect the data and the mission set. So again, I think our shift from a policy aspect is how do I look at this a little bit more holistic than I have been? And this also assumes that the hygiene is taken care of. We spent the last two years, I think it was Mr. Halverson, looking at the cybersecurity scorecard, scorecard 1.0. So we have, I think, a pretty solid idea of what's on the network. We have a fairly good idea of where it is. The challenge then becomes maintaining the security, if not necessarily of the endpoint, the data that goes to that endpoint, and how do we rid ourselves or modernize the legacy systems that we still have on the network. We're, I think, hitting critical mass where we have to do the rationalization of what are those applications that need to go away what are those we can truly afford to modernize? And what, what are those that we need to look across the military departments and agencies as an enterprise capability? A lot of this will require diversity of thought and diversity of people that we have during the workload, which comes back to, I think, Barb's opening comment about how do we introduce more females into the career field? How do we start the conversation early on with our elementary school girls specifically to talk to them about the importance of math and science and the creativity and opportunities that they bring to bear as they enter the career field. So a whole spectrum of things that I think we have to think about from a security aspect, but it all comes back to me to how do we ensure we have dependable mission assurance in the broad environment for the Department of Defense. Essie, thank you. So the other topic that Essie just opened up that probably makes this even more fun is there's not, there's not a standard set of timelines. Data, and, and some of you have me say this, data is like milk. It actually goes bad after a while. Um, and it has time frames when it needs to be protected and time frames when it doesn't. Um, I, I think this was uh, General Powell who said one of the comments is that, you know, when the enemy can put uh, small weapons, you know, fire into your position accurately. They probably know where you are, and maybe protecting that data is no longer as relevant as protecting some other data. And maybe mission, to get to SE's question of risk, the mission of the data becomes more important than the security of the data. This is a way that we, we, we've done this in combat. We've actually thought that way. You've all heard of the, you know, the historical examples of this, you know, when the, the Navy commander on the beach turned on his lights uh, so that the planes could see despite all the commands that said you can't do that. People have broken radio silence to get the mission done. That's a risk assessment. We need to be able to do that faster and more accurately today. How do you do that? And how do you do that just for fun in an environment that now does include the internet of everything? I do think it's important now to put the word every in front of that. It's the internet of everything. Um, my, I, I'm wearing my little watch today. Um, didn't think I'd like it. Um, now I'm dependent on it. It you know, takes phone calls. I can make phone calls from it. It can tell me all the fun facts that I didn't even know I wanted to know until the watch started talking to me. Um, we're living that way. That data is there. How do you change the protections? How do you have a Rio stat on your security that says today I need a 10 level of protection on this data. Tomorrow, and I literally mean tomorrow, I might not need any protection on the data. It has either become exposed or it's, it's the value of that data has decreased so much that spending money and time protecting it no longer makes sense. How do you trash data? At some point, you need to do that. 
how do you empty your data bin because you're storing so much stuff that you're still protecting that actually has no relevant data? These are some of the things that we are going to wrestle with as we move forward. So a, a couple questions that I'll throw out for the, the panel. Fastest growing data today is medical data. It is growing faster than any other data set. So first question I'm going to ask the panels to talk about what is today their impression of the security of medical data. And then from each of their perspectives, where do we think medical data is going, particularly because you now have medical data that exists for the patient, the doctor, and the insurance companies, all of them having different interests and different values on the same data. So Barb. All right. I think for DOD, we have all of our military members and uh, retired veterans. I'd say it's probably average, and that could be a high score. Um, again, a lot of our data is in uh, silos, and uh, we have an initiative going on right now between uh, DOD and Veterans Affairs. How can we work together better? How can we make the transition from when a uh, young military uh, person comes into the military, has their career, all their medical uh, information that gets gathered throughout their career, all the way through transitioning through retirement. We sort of uh, just drop the ball when they retire and then we hand everything off to the VA. Well, we should have a much more smoother pattern, a much more smoother flow of the data. So we are working with the Veterans Affairs to do that. Uh, we also have many initiatives in DOD where we are trying to modernize our infrastructure on the health affairs side. Uh, we are making moves to put that data into the cloud. And how do we secure it? Because as uh, Mr. Halvertson mentioned, we have a very federated approach. We have uh, the military members themselves, the personnel that have to deal with it. We have industry, the other medical facilities, all trying to access the same data. And how do we not have silos of it over and over and over? And how do we protect it? Because this is PII. This data does need to be protected. You want to make sure only the personnel that have um, the need to know uh, have access to it, and that gets back to roles and responsibilities and identity management. How do we validate who needs access to the data really does? So I think we have a uh, significant uh, way to go uh, as far as how we continue to improve how we deal with the medical data and information uh, for our military members. You also want to make it convenient for the user. You want to make sure that uh, if they need to access the data that they can do so from potentially a mobile device and how do we encrypt it and how do we secure it. So I think we have quite a ways to go as far as uh, protecting our data and making it accessible for uh, our military members. I know out in the private world, you guys all experience this, uh, everywhere you go now for medical providers, they all want you to get access to your data via the portal. They don't want you to call them. They don't want you to stop by and pick up medical records. They are directing you all to these portals to gain copy of medical results, your shots, any sort of test results, anything like that. And so we do need to learn from industry where they're going, how are they doing this, and then DOD needs to also adopt this uh, technology, this, these concepts, these ideas. And uh, we do need to figure out a good relationship with our industry partners in doing this because they are uh, also providing military or medical services to our military members. So I'd say, you know, our policy is probably fully up to date. We're ready 100% in the policy area for that, right? Exactly. <laughs> just, just go on your phone and try to download uh, an app to be able to access all your uh, medical data. I think the key issue that you talked about is this propensity that we now have as a society to hoard data. Um, I was talking last year with the chief privacy officer in government, and he was saying, you know, our biggest data risk right now is that we don't get rid of data. 
when we were in government and you had to, you know, when it was a time, either, whether it was an administration change, you would shred paper. We don't have that opportunity anymore. And I won't tell you how many emails I have on my phone right now, but it's embarrassing because we collect and we worry about what we don't get rid of. And so being able to figure out the technologies, as Essie was saying, that can help us prioritize data is important. And I don't think there's any space right now for which that is more important than in the medical space because we are collecting and there's so many privacy issues that are coming into play that that only sort of spurs this whole idea of hoarding data because we don't want to get rid of things, but we have to be careful for what we have. And I think this is where AI, machine to machine learning, human to human learning has to come into play. And the challenge when we bring in new technologies in these spaces is we tend to see a very quick learning curve and then it plateaus. And we have sometimes the human frustration with technology. We have to be able to tolerate failure in this space to get to where we need to be. From a policy perspective right now, we are not talking about prioritization of data. We're not talking about protecting it. We're just talking about collecting it. And I think to answer your question, Terry, the issue here is what are we doing to think about the security of that data, to know what to get rid of, and to know how to protect it and to segment it according to function. And this, to me, is, I think, with our greatest challenge. And while it's prevalent in the medical space, and that's something very personal for people because of, uh, unless you're in the medical profession, everybody is interfacing with that, those same issues are throughout all aspects of our lives. And so being able to identify the technology that helps us to prioritize, figuring out the ways to aggregate and then trash the data we don't need, and protect that from a privacy perspective, I think are the three key issues that we have to confront. Yes. So I'm going to channel my inner Stacy Cummings here from Defense Health. And Stacy is responsible for the De Defense Health Systems modernization. Uh, many of you may know that Cerner Lidos is the contractor responsible for moving us to electronic health records. And within the last month or so, the Veterans Affairs has decided that they will adopt uh, the same process and the same provider. So we've been working with VA, DHA, and Cerner probably for the last year on how we transition to an electronic health record system in a cloud-like environment. Now, actually, that was the first project you gave me when I moved over. Uh, hence, no hair. Um, the challenge was bringing a company into the space helping them to understand how DOD and federal government protects data, especially HIPAA-type data, and DOD understanding industry best practices and determining what was a good balance between the two. Uh, the, the interesting thing there is we've made adjustments on both sides with Learner as the provider here, changing some of their business model to accommodate hosting the, the government data. So as we bring the VA into this, it harkens back to me from when we started with the common access card, when we had to go back and identify common data elements, common data definitions, and how would we deal with that. So now as we talk to, obviously, Defense Health and Veterans Affairs, we'll have to walk that road again to understand what data elements, especially from a medical aspect, is common to both entities so that we can get to recruit to retire. And of course, in that process, the challenge becomes how do we put access controls in place for which providers have access to which information? How do we make that information readily available to them? And as we walk through this, we find that the doctors really like tap and go. You know, so they move the little kiosk into the room, they have a token, they tap it, and they pull whatever information because it keeps them from having to do a CAC logon, user ID, password, some of the things that we encourage them not to do from a protection aspect, which drives us to look at, okay, what's the next protection mechanism we need to put in place? And to Barb's point earlier, how do we deal with identity access as it comes to grabbing patient data at the time of need? So interesting discourse across the department, health affairs, 
and veteran affairs, but I think it puts us on the right course to put the data not necessarily in a single location, but where we need it so that we can access it quickly and to ensure that it is protected, but to also make that information available to the patient when the time comes. So I think we'll see a shift there, especially from a protection mechanism aspect, but we'll also see some best practices for business, uh, industry partners, to shift the way they're looking at protecting the data. It all comes back to the importance, especially as we deal with HIPAA. I think you, there's a couple key points, and it's the reason I pick on medical a little bit. One, certainly government had to learn some best industry practices, and you heard SC say that. It had to be a blend. But in the medical business, you've got some of the industry's worst practices going on. So I don't know how many of you have, you know, like a personal doctor might be running their own office. I'd ask you to just pause and think about the cybersecurity in your individual doctor's offices. Bob and I've had some fun discussions about this where I was able to show him some things that local doctor's offices probably don't protect very well against. So you've got an ecosystem here that involves everything from high-end security providers to you know, a, a doctor's office that might be the doctor, nurse, and one receptionist playing in this pool with absolutely no cybersecurity understanding about your data. And it's all out there. So this is going to be, and this is not the only ecosystem that we have to play this way. I use medical because it touches everybody, but think about supply for DOD a minute. We've got to deal with parts providers, maintenance providers from all of the ecosystems. You've got the same range. You could be dealing with a small business that has no concept of cybersecurity, large business that might not have any concept of cybersecurity, to people to get it. All of that has to be in the same mixture, same ecosystem, and at some point it's got to get protected at some level that meets the mission requirement. That's what we're going to all struggle with. How do you pull all of that together? And here's the other thing that all three of the panelists said that we may not pick off. Convenience is king. So how many of you in the audience have downloaded an app and decided to use it even though after you read all the warnings and all the places it was going to put your data, you said, uh, but I still want the scores, or I still want the shopping, or I still want whatever, or I just don't feel like having two passwords on my phone, so I'm just gonna use one. How many here have done that? And don't raise your hands. The answer is all of us have done that. We continue to do it. We do it in a global scale. We, won't, we, are, we want the convenience. So all of this has to be done at some level that's convenient for the user or users won't do it. And that's true in the military too. Um, you know, one of the absolute stupidest decisions that I was part of, I'll even take the blame for it, was implementing the infamous BlackBerry sled. Everybody loved it. it. It worked so well. It added hardly any time to your processing. And of course, in about six months, nobody was using the sled because it, it, yeah. <laughs> it was just a really bad idea. It, it, it forgot about the mission and, and users are going to think convenience. And if it gets too much in the way, they're not going to use it and they're going to find ways around it. So how about we get some questions now from the audience and we'll just ask those out. And if there's a law, I have some more fun questions for the panel. So who's got the first Thank question? You. The first question is, the services are struggling to store all the data generated by new intelligence and defense capabilities. And they've even said that they're overwhelmed. Is there a DOD plan to help them increase the utility of the data beyond simply archiving? I think we're waiting for someone to buzz in. I'm thinking. <laughs> well, that may be the answer. Um, I think this gets a little bit about, and then, and then I'd like Kirsten to talk about this, what Kirsten said. Right now, what we have is a philosophy that says, let's store everything. Let's just keep it. That probably isn't going to work. We're going to have to rethink that. So that means we're going to need some intelligent engines. And this probably gets to where Essie and Barbara talk about both AI and Kirsten to help us quickly look at data and decide what is relevant that's stored and what do we you know, send into the 
the electronic version of a shredder, it's gone, which is really hard to do, by the way. How do we do that? So I, I think that it's a great question. I think it, it, it's part of what we're going to have to think through. So let me ask, let me ask first Kirsten to comment about where we are with policy for that, and then Barb and Essie to think about how we implement toward that. Well, I, I do think this gets to the technology that we're creating in order to segment out data, to understand and to prioritize what that data looks like. There's something, I'm going to take a trajectory that Essie mentioned, which we haven't talked a lot about, but it's supply chain, and it's the security of third-party vendors, because we talked, the antiquated dialogue around critical infrastructure protection was government can't do this alone, 85% is owned by the private sector. That, that thinking very much translates into the security and the protection of data, I believe. I don't think government can do this on its own. We have to be thinking about how to collaborate with industry to be able to prioritize to secure data. I mean, as Terry said, government learns a lot from industry, and I do believe that the reverse is true as well. Um, and being able to come together. And so when we look at that engagement, I think one of the pieces that we haven't talked about as much in this conversation about data protection is third-party supply chain value chain security. Because if we can raise the bar there, I believe then we'll have greater efficiencies in how we handle data. We can't expect government enterprises, even by agency, to do all of that. And so when particularly you're looking at, at a complex structure like the Department of Defense and all the service agencies, it's being able to understand what is that efficiency and how do we engage with third parties, with industry, in a way that is effective, but also, quite critically, that is secure. And doing that uh, and, and thinking through how we do that uh, now rather than in response to something happening. So if I put my old CIO hat on, this harkens back to the basics yet again for me with records management and disposition rules. You know, there was a time when we would buy storage and over time move data to less valuable storage environments and it would slowly make its way out of the system. This is just as similar to that for me because as the relevance of that data and the value of that data diminishes, uh, we do need to get rid of it, but we are natural hoarders. I think the challenge then becomes for us, one, how do I automate that process? How do I take a look at, when was the last time that data was actually accessed? You know, what do we keep in that data for? But I think we've got to use AI and automation to help us with that, uh, to manage it because not, we won't do it on our own. It's, it's just a natural inclination that we feel we have to keep everything, which drives the need for security in that. So I think we've got to put some mechanisms in place to help us manage that. And part of it, quite frankly, will be the services understanding that at some point they'll have to let go. I think it's a great question, whoever in the audience asked, and as you saw, all three of us kind of hesitated. We really didn't have a good answer. Um, in some recent discussions I have been having with uh, the staff that works with me immediately, data has been coming up on a daily basis. Uh, a lot of the folks have been saying we need data standardization, we need a uh, data, uh, how do we deal with the volumes of data, what do we need to keep, what do we not need to keep, as you've heard uh, the other two panelists mention. But I think it is a fabulous question. We really need to look at uh, how, what the types of data we need in our future and how do we have a standard that goes across the board. How can we have enterprise standards so that we can use the data horizontally? As you've heard, we hoard data, so everything's in silos. We repeat that data over and over and over, and so our cost for storage and uh, maintaining it is just through the roof. So if we can figure out what is the data we need? What do we want to use? How do we want to share it? Then we can use it horizontally through the organization. We can just store it once. We can just protect it once. And then when there is no longer a need for it, we can you know, uh, dispose of it properly. But as uh, you heard, none of us really jumped on that answer. 
Uh, we do, we have a lot to, of work to go, uh, a lot of work to do as far as how are we going to deal with data in our future, how are we going to store it, how are we going to secure it. So it is a great question, um, open for industry to help, uh, you know, enlighten us as to the opportunities or uh, things that you have uh, learned. Uh, as far as how to store data, how to use it horizontally, and, you know, ed educate DOD. I mean, we don't know it all. We need to rely on industry to help enlighten us on what are the uh, opportunities, the art of the possible that you have out there uh, that we can leverage and learn from. So one of the things from an industry perspective that I will tell you I am certainly thinking about in my current role, I do think this begins to open up a very expanded version of data as a service. Um, I think this is something we are going to have to think a lot about, but I think it has great potential from an industry market space. How do you become a data service provider that handles all of the things, not just the traditional storage or the traditional sets of known data that you, you know, process for somebody, but how do you truly become the, the data processor, server, kind of owner, broker, all of those things in one. I think this is going to be one of the big businesses of the future, certainly at Samsung and my role, I am looking at how we would do that. I think that is going to be a huge role for industry as we go forward. Next question. Thank you. Building on that response, are we asking too much of current or even near future technology to somehow discern the difference between types of data to sort, dispose, or use it in real time? And are there examples of someone doing this right or at least better? So I'm going to take the first part. Are we asking too much of technology? No. I don't think you can ever ask too much of technology. I think we keep me pressing that. Are we sometimes accepting the technology earlier than it's fully mature? The answer to that is yes, but I think you have to do that too. I mean, it does get a little bit to the risk equation. If you don't ever do that, then nothing ever moves forward. Um, I'll ask the panelists if they have any examples of things they have seen where that's beginning to work or show promise. I, if I go back to my Air Force days, we tried this several times with uh, EIM and ERM, but I think, Terry, to your point, we were a bit early in accepting the limitations of technology versus driving the requirements that we had for technology, and that we tried to push ourselves into a workflow process where it really wasn't about data, data storage, and data management. It was about your traditional information management type things. So. It, no, I don't think we're, we're pushing the limits of technology, but I do think we need to do a better job of establishing the standards and the requirements that we have in that regard. And I'll just expand on that a little bit. I, I absolutely agree. I think um, the technology is out there. Um, I think an example of where we're seeing this, I'll flip this a little bit on its side, is looking at threat detection and what's being done in that space. Um, I referenced, you know, uh, White House Chief of Staff John Kelly's phone being compromised. Uh, individual from Lookout Mobile Security wrote an op-ed about how they knew that that was a nation-state actor versus and, a, and an advanced persistent threat versus just sort of a lesser <laughs> malicious actor. The information that we're collecting around threat detection and what's being done to me is a representation of how technology is starting to segment and segregate that data. I think one of the points that Essie made early on, which is really important in this space as well, is the risk management approach. So technology has the ability to go, I think, as far as we need it to go. We tend to stop sometimes at the compliance answer. And if we are truly bringing this and integrating technology into a risk management approach, we will get more out of our, out of our technology and we will be able to get to that place where we can, where it continues to meet, answer the mail and meet the demands of what we have. Because if you think about what we knew, particularly in the mobile space and the data space just a couple of years ago, and what we know now, the uh, Pegasus threat last summer, um, these different types of act actors and activities, that to me is a demonstration of how technology is responding to uh, our current threat environment and the general protection and privacy environment. 
So Kirsten has talked about, and I, I agree with this, in the intel and threat community where we can't go into specifics, there have been some great breakthroughs. But I, the other example of a place that probably is relevant to everybody in the office where this type of data integration and intelligent thought is there is in the commercial retail. Have any of you gotten this week a message from any commercial retail person that said, maybe you should be interested in this product and it was right? I'll tell you how, yeah. How, yeah, I will tell you how integrated this can get. So I told you I had my new watch. I was, when I first got it, I was walking around uh, my office space in DC, which is down here in the Georgetown area, and I happened to be walking by a, a Whole Foods, and I heard voices. I couldn't figure out where they were coming from. I literally heard voices and couldn't figure out, and then my watch was telling me I was at Whole Foods, and that when I shop at Whole Foods, I generally buy these things, and given the last time I had bought them, I probably was missing and needed these things. Now, I have to be on travel, but it was absolutely uncanny. The integration of that data, actually all three of the things that told me I should buy had I been, you know, at, at like normally my home in, in Pensacola, which I get to see occasionally, I would have actually went in and bought all three of those things. I, that integration has unbelievable potential for supply chain and DOD supply chain and big companies. So the retail industry is taking that data and integrating it in ways um, that it gets a little scary, but absolutely we will all use. So that's a great success story. And I think industry, the message to us is how do we do that for big enterprises? You know, we're doing that at consumer retail. All of that could be doable for big enterprises um, with, with a little bit different spin on those applications. Barb? Uh, based on the previous question and what uh, Mr. Havertson just said, I do not think that we are doing enough or industry is doing enough. As we've heard Kristen and we've heard Essie both say, artificial intelligence, we have just barely tapped into that technology. And I think it provides a whole new venue uh, for DOD, for industry, and for data. Uh, that we just don't even realize. And so I am really excited uh, as I glanced around some of the booths that are out here, you know, some of the vendors that are just going into that environment and uh, things that they've learned and things that DOD can learn from them. So I think that, no, we have not done enough uh, either industry-wise and DOD has so much to learn from industry in these areas. You know, we have all these supercomputers that, you know, we're just now learning how to tap into and, uh, you know, get them to help us solve problems and issues and, you know, even cure diseases just by asking them the right questions. So we have so much more to learn, and I, I do not think we are anywhere near the potential we can be. Thank you. The next question is, how can we align government, industry, and academia better to meet the challenges of data management? Obviously have more FCA meetings. <laughs> yeah, Bob held that sign up, so I had to, get, I had to say that. I, I do think that uh, the forums that like this are, are helpful. Um, I think one of the things we've got to work on on all these forums is how do we actually get more interaction? I mean, the panels are nice, I think they're, they're helpful but how do we actually get more networking and interaction throughout the event? I think that's gonna be critical. I think there's an area where, again, technology holds some key um, advantage. There's some technologies out, and, and now that, that I, I'm not in the government, I can say these technologies by, by name. There's a technology out called uh, Waggle. I, I am not associated with Waggle. Don't make any money with Waggle, but if you haven't looked at it, it's interesting because it lets you do online real-time real -time demonstrations of data. So you can ask a question and get a quick answer from a crowdsource. So you targeted it to ones you want and, and, and use that and see and have an engaging discussion that keeps refining and refining until you actually get to a crowd kind of sourced answer that's relevant to the question in the environment you're in. It, it's, I think that's very powerful. And that's just the beginning of how we should be having some of this technology help us increase the dialogue between the government, academia, and, and industry. But we've got a real expert on that. So, Kristen, if you would. <laughs> you're making me an expert in so much, I'm not sure that I, I this is the compliance checklist. Um, well, <laughs> 
what I would say is I, I think where the, the gaps have been and where we could do a better job is actually aligning needs with responses. So we have a lot of activity out there. Where I would believe we could be more effective is if government or industry comes to academia or academia comes to government industry to have more of a direct relationship around these are the needs that we have. How can we work with you to get to the pilots, to get to the solutions? Um, because there is so much activity in this space. And being able, I mean, it's, it's this challenge that we have overall, which is we have so much and figuring out how to prioritize it. I think there, need to, there needs to be more effort made at prioritizing and scoping problems and solutions in a way that actually gets them into execution and being able to work with those entities that are doing the research, those entities that need to execute on that research in a way that can be effective. Because there, I, I think there's a gap right now in that alignment around this is what we need and, and this is what we're going to do. I think DARPA you know, was a great example of what that looks like and being able to evolve that into this age of technology and data and mobility is where we need to go. And that partnership, I think, to the one of the earlier questions, that partnership is what needs to happen to create those efficiencies. I would say that for DOD, we are trying to go down this path. We've got uh, an initiative called our IT Exchange Program, where we are putting government uh, individuals in industry, and we are bringing industry individuals into Department of Defense. And we have uh, learned a great deal. We need to expand that program more and do more with it. Uh, because that is how we are going to be able to infuse DOD with more technology, more information by this exchange program. Uh, we have other uh, initiatives going on in DOD, which is our DIUX and our DDS uh, and program, our programs or, or initiatives where they are bringing new technology, new ideas, they're doing prototypes. And so this is where DOD is also uh, learning also from, we have DARPA and all those other initiatives, but these are, uh, I'll say, some smaller scale organizations that have been able to bring a, uh, quite a few concepts and ideas uh, to fruition just by uh, helping DOD to see a different angle, a different side, a different way of looking at a problem. And so we are leveraging those initiatives within DOD for innovation and getting new technology ideas as to how to implement. I won't get a discount for this, but my answer as I talk to folks from universities is that they consider engaging FCA more because that is the connection between the department and industry to bring academia into the conversation. And I think we have to foster that relationship with them as well. Thank you. The challenges of data protection begin with individuals and expands to organizations and government and is expanding almost by the day. How do we prepare our schools and colleges to prepare our future workforce and leaders to use and secure data to meet the challenges that we can't even see today? So I think that this, is, this has got to be education and not training. And, and there are, I think, a difference, and this is one of those discussions people have all the time, but I think you need to educate people about what it means to have their data exposed. Because all the, you can't go teach specific techniques because by the time you teach them, you know, you start also, the specific techniques will be gone, will have changed them. I think it's teaching and understanding about what it means to have your data out there and having people be able to make intelligent decisions about what they can expose, what it means to expose it, how do you take the, and enterprises, everything we're talking about for individuals here applies to enterprises too. It, it, it's, it's a different perspective that you have an enterprise view, but this is about an education and understanding the risk assessment equation and the value of your data. I do think we will see, again, for industry, a different type of economic exchange beginning to occur where Individuals and enterprises are going to demand more value for the data that they give up. You see this a little bit in Europe right now where they're a little bit farther ahead in some of these policies about how they are now writing policy that gives the European citizens some way to either control what they give up or if they decide to give up data to get some value 
from the corporations that are using their data. It's again going to be a different economic model, but it, I think that will help drive us to some answers too. Panelists, comments? Um, I would say that I think it's a partnership between the federal government or the DOD and agencies with the community. We need to ensure that our young, upcoming workforce understands the environment we have today. We don't, we, I understand that yes, what we are doing today at DOD will, uh, may not be what they experience when they come into the workforce. But I think we need to expose them and educate them on the challenges and the types of environment we have today. Um, I am hosting in December 60 high school students who are part of a Cisco program. They're going to come through the Department of Defense. They're going to get exposed to all the various forms of IT. And it helps them apply their theory and learning in the classroom with real world experience. And then as they go through their career, they can sort of realize, okay, how can I make things different? How can I change the environment going forward? You know, I, I see DOD dealing with the infrastructure and the challenges they have today and the IT infrastructure they have today. How can I make it better? How can I make a difference and, you know, come up with better solutions? So I think it's uh, educating our young uh, to be workforce, working with the community, working with industry, and educating them so that they all can work together for a better future uh, for all of us. And I absolutely agree um, with what Barb was saying because it is about, to, when you're getting a first grader that's getting a computer to do their reading or their math, there should be cyber education that's incorporated into that. I embarrassed my fifth grader at back to school night because they got Chromebooks and my only question was, so are you teaching them the security around what it means to get on these computers? And the answer I got was, you know, well, the IT person tells them what they can't, you know, what they can't research and that, that's not the answer I was looking for. Um, because we are creating a workforce, right? I mean, when you look at why kids go in, what their interests become, it's the people that are in their sphere, doctors, teachers, construction workers, grocery store checkout people, that's in their sphere. Cybersecurity is in their sphere. We have a lot of these efforts and initiatives right now that are about how do we attract people into the workforce, and I'll, I'll get into that in a moment, but we need to have two approaches. We need to have the near term and the long term, and the long term is how we're educating children at a very young age about what they're doing and the impact that, to the question, they ha as an individual have. This is an opportunity that we have to grow that culturally. Uh, an example was made to me recently that I actually I thought was very strong. We have all these metaphors in the cybersecurity space to safety, to bicycle helmets, but when we look at the impact that children can have about learning something, the example that was given to me was recycling. Because kids are taught about recycling in school. We, in our generation, didn't grow up with it as much, but they're the ones that are like, no, you've got to put that in the blue container, you've got to put that in the green container. It's a very simple demonstration of what happens when we just teach the basics to them and how that can start to create the cultural change around security, but then also the workforce that we're developing. And I want to go back to something that Barb said earlier, which is these exchange programs, because what we heard a lot in the commission was, how do we bring talented people into government? Well, I mean, I give you a, exhibit A, B, and C, but aside from that, it's looking at where is the value between industry and government, and that happens through exchange programs. We had, uh, one of the commissioners was the CEO, is the CEO of MasterCard, and he talked about the value of bringing in those with government experience into MasterCard to understand those two spaces. So when we're looking at developing that workforce, exchange programs across sectors I think are critical, and there are lots of different incentives that we can use to develop those. And the final point I'll make is, when we talk about cybersecurity as a profession, and this goes to some of the other workforce development, it's not just about technology, it's not just about engineering, it is also policy. I am not a ones and zeros person. I can answer the multiple choice question on those. I cannot answer the essay portion on looking at what that means. But there are all of these key facets, and it's important that we educate individuals that this is a comprehensive interdisciplinary issue. And to, in order to be a part of it, you should have 
access and understanding to all of these pieces. So we need to do a better job of creating a common curricula across programs in educational programs at the higher education level to raise the bar, but also to ensure that each of those disciplines are represented and taught. So one of the fun things that we ought to try to do as industry and AFCA is, but why don't we think about, and, and I'm, I'm willing to sponsor some of that, why don't we think about moving and having a group in AFCA that creates a education for, you know, first grade on up about cyber environment, what it means. I think that, that, that would be something industry could do that would be legacy. AFCA could help with that. We could bring in the government. So let's just popped in my head, let's think about that. That may be a, a good topic. And I bet you there's people out here in the audience would be happy to participate in that, both from government and industry. And we already have our chair, so it's perfect. And we also take advantage of Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Oh, perfect. Almost, Almost like, like that, that was planned. planned. Exactly. <laughs> actually say something collaborative about Cybersecurity Awareness Month? I think it's great, but I think we need to do a better job of making every month Cybersecurity Awareness Month. I think that is a mentality when we were trying to get people to think about cybersecurity. And so we, I believe, have an opportunity and a mission to be talking about this and highlighting it on a regular basis. And I think to Terry's point that this is, we, there's an opportunity here on the education side to do a lot with this and changing the culture. So somebody out there needs to develop the cyber security calendar. The virtuals that pops up on your screen every morning and gives you your morning cybersecurity hint 365 days a year. I don't have anything so, else to do. So somebody out there has that oh, idea and can do that. Get, the, get on that. Thank you. The next question is, what are the data considerations that should be considered when defining key cyber terrain? Who wants to buzz in? I think you have to go back to the mission and the operation that that data is affiliated with and start there with the basics. I don't know how else to answer that. We've got to understand why we're we using the data, what the data is being, uh, how the data is being aggregated, and who is using the data for what purpose. And then, I, say, I think the only challenge, I, I absolutely agree uh, with Essie, and I think our only challenge is we tend to understand data for what we see in the here and now. The challenge becomes when we use that data differently. And that's one of the arguments that we're hearing a lot from industry, which is, I've developed this technology for this purpose. If it's being used differently than what we developed it for, or it's being used maliciously, whose responsibility is that? And that can't be up to me then to secure it. And I think that's one of the, the greatest challenges that we have in this space right now, is we can't anticipate how data is going to be used in the future. And I would add that we need to be open-minded as to how we can use this data. We don't want to, you know, get back into bad behavior, old behavior of storing it in silos. We want to be able to take this data and if we find a new use for it, a new uh, question that we need to address, how do we leverage it horizontally in the organization? And we need to be, you know, as Kristen said, open-minded to how we reuse this data. If it's appropriate. You don't want to just have the data all out there for anyone to access or to use, but we need to be mindful of how can we use it, you know, horizontally across the enterprise. I'll be more direct. I think we should absolutely have a movement to ban the term key cyber terrain. It actually almost has no meaning anymore. There's key terrain, there's key data that have cyber aspects. When we start labeling things cyber terrain, cyber data, I, I think that def it actually defeats what we're trying to do. It, and it makes things focus on a cyber environment that's not actually what we want. We want to focus on the environment and the cyber aspects of any environment that we're in. So if, if you want, send me a note and we'll start the, the movement now to ban that term. I, I think we have time for one last question for the panel. Where does the panel fall in the debate over on over-centralized data repositories, vice data held, for example, by the services to ensure resilience and redundancies? Could, yeah, could you repeat that question? Absolutely. 
Where does the panel fall in a debate on over-centralized data repositories, vice data held, for example, by the services to ensure resilience and redundancies? Okay, panel, jump right in. If I understood the question, I uh, and you've heard me say, I think you need to ensure that you can reuse the data as often and as much as you can and not store it in silos and disparate systems or applications where it cannot be reused. You need to ensure that it's protected and that the people with the right roles and responsibilities can access the data. Uh, but I do not see uh, data being too over centralized. We do need to worry about security and how we protect it. That is uh, an absolute must. But I think we need to, as I said earlier, once you are storing the data, how can you reutilize that data where it's needed and ensure that it is protected and only the people with the right roles and responsibilities need to know can access the data. My first job out of grad school was working for General McCaffrey, and he said, if you don't like the question, you can just answer whichever one you want. So if I'm, I'm not sure I totally understand the question, but I'll, I'll answer it in a way that I hopefully addresses some of the issues, which is, I think we, what we want to get away from are dumping grounds of data. We don't just want to create uh, broad, general repositories. Um, I, but I take the point about resilience and redundancy, and to me, that's about how technology can support the aggregation and the segmentation and the prioritization of data. So again, this is the, the technology and the human interface to be able to create the right approach to ensure that we're being effective in how we store that data, that we are creating the resilience and redundancy without that resilience and redundancy being just keeping it. Um, I think that's an important difference. It's just keeping data is not a resilience approach. Um, it's not a redundancy approach. And so we've got to be using technology more effectively to achieve that outcome, but not by hoarding data. And to keep that data relevant and timely. And I think it comes back to exposure and transparency, understanding who has a need or requirement for the data, and make sure we're exposing that information to the right folks. Yeah, I'd actually love that to be the problem that we should be solving today, but that's not the problem we're in, in a space in yet. Um, our problem is data in too many places and too many places claiming to be the authoritative data source on data. I think last time we looked in government, we were storing the social security number in 56 different places, all of them claiming to be authoritative. That's a little scary. Um, we do that with a lot of data. That doesn't make any sense. So my answer to that would be, I'd love to get to the point where I was worried about the over-centralization of data. Don't think we're there yet. Thank you for your questions. Please join me in welcoming Lieutenant General Bob Wood back to the stage. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Wake out there. I think this is a lucky audience. Uh, let's give the uh, panel a hand. Uh, you know, I, I think Terry was absolutely right when he, he said data and let's talk about it in a forum where we can discuss the strengths, weaknesses, and the requirements. And all of us here had a chance to listen to a wonderful panel with great insights, give a, a set of perspectives that one with the business opportunities on one side and the other with the mission assurance. Uh, very, very well done. Thank you so much, uh, Terry, for, for teeing it up for sure. And on behalf of the panel, uh, FCA will make a donation to the Fisher House. Thank you so much for being with us. 